Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to What's Next in Music 2022. Yay! So the next topic that we have um, is quite a complex but very important and very interesting topic. It's called Listen Local, how to avoid that local artificial intelligent algorithms colonize the Lithuanian music ecosystem and balancing the post-COVID revenues with increased sales on global platforms. And we have a guest speaker uh, who's Daniel Antal, and he's a certified financial analyst. And for those who don't know, um, I can explain just a little bit of what that is. So that's um, a designation usually for people working in finance and um, economists area uh, where they have to pass a set of very difficult exams to um, uh, to actually have this title and the exams consist of um, your knowledge being tested in various investment tools, valuation assets uh, and portfolio management. So Daniel is a CFA and he's a data scientist uh, as well. Uh, he founded the Digital Music Observatory uh, which is an open knowledge and data sharing platform for music stakeholders, universities, non-governmental organizations, ministries, um, and basically the organization aims to make sure that global platform algorithms do not colonize local music ecosystems. So Daniel so far has helped to improve the royalties collected and paid out in several countries. Um, and he created the Hungarian, Slovak, Croatian, and Central European music industry reports where he provided evidence-based policy and business strategy guidance for the music sector. So very nice to have you here, Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, do you hear me well? Yes. Apologies for my voice. <clears throat> I have a really bad cold, um, so sorry about that. No problem. So shall we start with a presentation that you have prepared for us? And then, as always, after the presentation, uh, you can think of questions and we'll have a Q&A where we can start a discussion and talk about the topic. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Thomas. And it's also really nice to see a few faces um, that we met professionally before <clears throat> in other venues. Um, yes, so I'll start with the presentation. I will try to be quite short. Um, so I will quickly go through a few slides. They are just for reference. They are online on our website um, with other material. Um, and I would like to leave room for questions. So I don't want to fill out um, the time allocated in this session. I really hope that we can start a discussion. Um, I'll just set up, <clears throat> stand up, because it's also easier for me. Um, <clears throat> So what I would like to convey here with my broken voice is an invitation to join our open collaboration platforms, two of them, the Digital Music Observatory and Listen Local Lithuania. Listen Local Lithuania is managed by Mark, who I think is quite well known here. Um, and um, that's um, where I want to start with. So. <clears throat> I was asked by my guests to get straight to the point and leave the more complicated things for questions. So what I would like to do um, is two things. One, to start a program that helps Lithuania's creators to catch up in revenues with the European average, which means that Lithuanian creator revenues, including musician revenues, should level up to Finland and Germany eventually. The second one is to make sure that Spotify or YouTube actually recommends Lithuanian music here in Lithuania to Lithuanian people, which is not always the case. And go a little bit further, that it sometimes also recommends it to people who might be interested outside of Lithuania and increase that very, very small 100,000 euro export revenue that Lithuania has in total now in music. Um, so, you would be asking, um, who is this guy who's claiming that can make really big change? 
I would like to talk a little bit about my work that I started about 11 years ago. <clears throat> As uh, Thomas introduced me, I'm coming from evaluation field and I started to work with several countries, uh, collective management organizations to help bringing up their income level to the European standards. We started in Hungary, then Slovakia joined and Croatia joined. Um, and we started to build a regional knowledge base and regional synchronized databases to support this work and change the valuation of the catalogs of these countries. Um, in 2017, only three years later, I was in a CISA conference, that's the global body of collective management societies, who were ranking the growth of more than 100 countries' collective management systems. And in the top four countries, three were part of this cooperation, Slovakia coming top. So basically, Slovakia's revenues, Slovak alters revenues, increased by 40% at that time in three years. Now, this is not really magic. They were very low. Um, <clears throat> but we could put together a program that could really concentrate on those things that were really, really broken and uh, make a big change quickly. So first of all, I think um, what was very important in these countries that somebody stood up and said that, hey, we didn't join the European Union and its single market to pay less than people in Austria, which <clears throat> for Slovakia and Hungary is always a reference point. Um, we should be questioning if skilled people with often university degrees working as creators, why should they earn less than other similarly skilled workers? Why should artists get less than other occupations? Why Lithuanians should get less than the European average? So eventually we should start to set a goal that we're going to catch up. So we did a lot of analysis. We compared uh, musicians and uh, local population, um, relative income. Uh, we also included in this research uh, Lithuania uh, with the help actually of Thomas and his colleagues. <clears throat> this was a research that was sponsored by State 51. And um, then we created very complex comparisons. You don't have to understand the details, but you will find the links. Um, this is a model that we created in Hungary and Slovakia to actually understand how people are enjoying music, what kind of revenues are connected to that, where are the weak points, and what needs to be changed. Um, if you will click through the slides, uh, if you want to reference them, these are links the blue letters so you can actually find out more. The second topic is the Listen Local project. We also started this from a very different angle in Hungary and Slovakia where we wanted to make sure that in the shops and the shopping malls in Budapest and Bratislava some local music is paid. So all those revenues, all those royalties paid by a shopping mall in Budapest are not all going to the US and the UK. And uh, eventually, around 2017, we realized that um, Spotify, Deezer, and Apple will pose a much bigger problem than anything else that we saw before. In Hungary, at that time, the local market share of music was about 30% in almost all channels or more. And in Spotify, we started with free. So <clears throat> we started a program um, which actually got quite far in Slovakia. We were in a lucky position in Slovakia that the local legislation just introduced a new law that stipulates that 15% of the music played in radios should be Slovak, which caused a lot of problems, by the way. But then we could reassess, okay, how we can achieve a 15% market share across the board in streaming and radio as well. Um, such laws are present in about 90 countries, so almost all developed nations, except for the US and the UK, of course, who are big exporters, and the Netherlands, where I live. <clears throat> now, in this project, which will be something that we will replicate with Mark in Lithuania, um, we were asking very simple questions when we figured out that there's very, very little 
Slovak music recommended to Slovak people and the market share of Slovak music is quite low. We try to figure out if the algorithms are cheating on Spotify and if yes, what we can do. Or is the algorithm which uses machine learning, so the machines are learning from existing data, are learning from wrong information, wrong knowledge. And um, that was another project that you can download its feasibility study in English, which I think is a very interesting read because it's intended for a general readership. So anybody who has an interest on changing the situation. <clears throat> now, I would like to say that what we have done in these countries can be replicated in Lithuania. I think that Lithuania is no different. I think that Lithuania actually very much resembles Slovakia to me. It's a similar developed country, similar size, similar sized capital. Um, and we've been in touch with some professionals here, and given that I don't speak Lithuanian, with their help and with a bit of um, deep learning machine translate, I try to understand what's going on. And I think that the situation that is described in this uh, music policy document and then in this um, excellent and super exciting Artec recommendations that just came out, I see that basically the problems and the attitude <clears throat> that we find in this country is very similar to those that started our cooperation. You can also find these documents via the links. And then I would like to talk about more concrete steps. So I was talking about the past. We did, I think, really cool things. We increased revenues. We started to find out why algorithms are working against small nations. And more and more organizations started to join this program. So what I do with my company, Reprex, we're just building open tool sources to help in these problems. More and more organizations started to use their knowledge and open source tools. And eventually this was recognized by the European Commission as a best practice. And I think for Lithuania it's very important to see that best practice can come from Slovakia and Hungary. So the revenues in Hungary and Slovakia are not on the level of Denmark, which is the highest in the European Union. And if you meet Danish professionals responsible for maintaining them, you will see extraordinary professionalism. And if you're rich and keeping yourself rich requires professionalism all the time. But the EU thought that that's not the best practice because it needs a very different skill set to bring up the poor to a higher level. So increasing Slovak revenues by 40% is a more difficult task than just keeping the Danish revenues where they are. So in 2019, the European Commission realized when they were planning the European Music Observatory, a joint tool for every European country's music systems to help them, that what we're doing is already halfway there. It's actually coming from the poorer part of Europe, so it can actually help. And uh, they started to encourage me to build a research and innovation consortium around this to be officially recognized as best practice and actually to prototype a tool that can help everybody. So with a lot of work, I put together, I think, a really wonderful consortium for this. And we won in this competition and were selected by the European Commission. Um, in this cooperation, we have um, music organizations, all sorts of them, including SOZA, the Slovak Authors' Rights Association, whose practices we will try to open up for everybody. Um, we have research universities. We have <clears throat> the Turku Data Science Group from uh, Finland, who are excellent open source academic software designers. Um, we have uh, Santana, econometricians, um, the famous Ivir Law School of Amsterdam, lawyers who are metadata and copyright specialists and working on ideas how to make these systems work better everywhere in Europe. Um, and of course, uh, we have uh, 
our friends here from Germany, from Sinus, who are coordinating this project and the market research company. Um, <clears throat> and we're trying to, in this project, which is a big three million euro, three years, many country project, we're trying to build tools for policy design, for valuations and diversity policies, the things that I've been talking about that can be transported to other countries. Our promise is that we will work with Bulgaria because they are the poorest now in the EU and try to bring up their revenues and visibility a bit. But our project is also open for Lithuania and others. Concluding remarks. Um, so I was talking now mainly from a practitioner's perspective. So if you're an artist or label or a publisher, you want more revenues and visibility, but we would like to put this into a policy perspective. Um, we're going to use a policy framework for the first time in Europe. It was developed in the US and used first by the World Bank. Um, it's called Open Policy Analysis. It is a way of implementing some modern research automation, open source software, open science tools into policy design. Um, we're going to work in technical standards that allow us to continue refresh the documents that we're making with the latest data. So instead of having a PDF document that shows you what is the best example with a few charts, those charts will be every day looking for new data and refreshing themselves, adding new things to read from libraries where they find similar documents and so on. Um, so that's the last thing that I wanted to know, to tell that Obviously, we believe that if you really want to achieve a big change, like we did in these countries, then the national organizations like collective management societies, national library, national museum, ministry of culture actually have to work together. Um, so there's a lot of things that small organizations can do on their own, but eventually, if the Google algorithm is cheating you, you have to bring at one point them to court, so the courts have to be able to take evidence. The local consumer protection agencies, child protection agencies, when the algorithm is recommending, I don't know, uh, indecent content for children, have to be able to trace these problems. So we're trying to uh, build documents that help local organizations also in a very practical way how to cope with the modern challenges of music and also I think that these challenges are present in film, books, fashion, everywhere when digitization is going on. Um, two more things um, but very briefly because I hope that there will be questions. For this we're building two databases which will be open source and absolutely open to opt-in or opt-out. One for artists and War for Fans, which will try to catalog uh, Lithuania's music heritage and current music production. Um, and that's about it. So, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, I guess just to summarize everything a little bit, um, there was a, a good story from one label in Hungary um, that started their work back in, I think, uh, 1950s. Uh, at the time, there were monopoly within the country, and obviously, um, there were um, physical formats um, at that time, and they were selling all the music, and people were buying all the music, and essentially, they were monopoly in Hungary. But then when free market came in 1990s, um, the situation changed rapidly and loads of new um, Western music flooded the Hungarian market. And essentially what happened, they lost a very big market share from what they, what they had. So the market went from being a total monopoly uh, with maybe some things happening on the side to um, um, a free market where that monopoly was um, very, very um, affected, very much affected. So in this digital world, um, would you say the same thing is happening in streaming where the local uh, music is, is getting um, cannibalized by or colonized by the AI algorithms? And w would you um, 
would you say there's any platforms in particular that um, that you can share with us that are mostly responsible for this, or this is mostly happening across all the streaming sector and all of them are doing these practices uh, more or less? Well, I, I think that um, a good comparison with the start of the free market and then what changed with the global um, streaming platforms in terms of competition is that in, in Hungary, which of course I know very well, um, before the digital platforms arrived, there were record stores. There were more than 1,000 people working in the record stores who were recommending you music. There were journalists recommending you music. But you could buy legally music from the record stores and the entire inventory of the shops that was present in the country was about 100,000 songs because you couldn't keep in stock every record from the world. The Hungarian radios and televisions usually play about 30 to 40,000 songs altogether a year. Now you have Spotify and these are with about 60, 70 million songs available. Right, right. So essentially, if the, the number of, of tracks and just the quantity of music that exists today, would you say that, probably almost definitely, that there would be no chance humans can manage the quantities of the catalog? Exactly. So we need algorithms, yes. but we need fair algorithms. Yes, yeah, so, so, so basically there's no human curator in a radio or a festival promoter who can review 70 million tracks. So everybody, festival promoters, radio curators, playlist curators, rely to some extent on machine learning algorithms. Now the big question is if these algorithms are working fairly, and another question if you have the technical capacity to work with these algorithms in both sides, also feeding them new information and learning what they do. Right, so let's dive a little bit more into how the algorithms work. Um, and you mentioned a couple of times in your presentation uh, a cheating algorithm. So can you perhaps give any examples of what would be a fair algorithm and any sort of examples yes. of what a cheating algorithm might be? If you can go back to my presentation, I have a backup slide. I just didn't know if we're going into this direction. Uh, is it possible to put back the... Thank you. Um, I'll start here. It, it will be a bit longer reply, but I think interesting. So I started to understand what's going wrong when we were building Listen Slovak, Slovak, Listen Local Slovakia with Forgetify. That's a very funny little app that plays songs from Spotify, only songs that have never been played. Not even... And I guess sisters, there's quite, quite a lot of them, right? There was some stat like two-thirds of the tracks on Spotify yes. never been played yes. once, something like yes. this? Yeah. Not even their friends, mothers, sisters. Right. Why bother? So, yeah. And then I tried to figure out what kind of music is there and you find like really my assistant's cat was jam jumping from some 70s psychedelic Turkish thing. <laughs> but then you also find like a Grammy winner Cuban jazz musician whose heritage label just dumped everything there and nobody knows about right. it. So, so good quality music you can find for sure. Absolutely among the top 100 jazz artists in the world. So all sorts of things, and we tried to figure out how you get there because we thought that if you're talking about the bad outcome of an algorithm, ending up with your music here is definitely a good definition. And I would like to give a, a textbook example of a bad outcome when it is difficult to trace. Now this will be a step back, it has nothing to do with music. This is a textbook example of how you chase a bad algorithm. It's, uh, the analogy is with a firing squad. So there's a traitor here, and he was found out that he's a traitor and his comrades have to execute him. But it's a very unpleasant task uh, because you have to shoot at your former comrade even though he's a traitor. So what the firing squad does is that they line up 10 soldiers and the officer says that five of you has a blank cartridge, the other five has live ammunition, 
You have to shoot at the same time. The guy will be 100% dead, but you have a 50% chance that you didn't kill him. Now, when we are trying to find out what goes wrong with a very complex system, which is the music recommendation system of YouTube or Spotify is, then you have a very similar problem that there is no single bullet theory to pursue. We try to find out if the algorithm is somehow manipulated against you or, based, or the algorithm is just learning from wrong information or something else. And what we found in Slovakia, well, there are all sorts of problems. I will just <clears throat> um, list here a few things of what makes, according to the EU, um, an algorithm trustworthy and ethical. But what we found out is that um, there's a lot of things missing. Usually, um, these algorithms don't get fed into up-to-date information from the small countries. So they don't know enough about the Slovak artist. Usually, there's no human agency and oversight that we want to do in our project, that we actually humans see what goes up from Lithuania. And so there are many things that can go wrong, and it would be absolutely irresponsible to say that, okay, I really know that the trick how to beat the Spotify algorithm is this, but that's what we do. We try to find which are the bullets that actually right. hit. Um, looking from the legal perspective, are there any sort of legal laws or regulations in terms of algorithms and what platforms can do with those and how they can make them or how they can't make them and what counts as manipulation? Well, the policy brief that we're trying to draw is actually would be helping the Lithuanian legislation and regulators to cope with these problems because these laws are evolving. Some of them are already European Union law, but the law is just as much. I mean, if a Lithuanian consumer protection or child protection agency, I, I always refer to children because we want to prevent that the algorithm is recommending some stuff to children. That's a very important thing. Um, so these agencies need to apply these laws. So if you say that, oh, I think that there's a dark algorithm that is recommending child pornography, I want to take them to court. What kind of evidence you bring to a Lithuanian courthouse? I mean, so we're trying to build both educational and practical examples what laws need to be changed in Lithuania, but I think that's the least of the problem, how you train state agencies to deal with these issues. So right now, I think that a lot of laws exist, but if you would be a Lithuanian creator who's uh, cheated by the algorithm, I just don't know who would be able to file your complaint in Lithuania. Right. Um, I guess at this point, we can open up to questions from the audience. We still have plenty of time. So if, if there's any hands raised, we have a microphone. Um, should there be any questions now, we can pick them up. If not, we're just going to continue the discussions and you can raise your hand at any time. And we're going to come up, up to you. Um, and we're going to listen to your question. Um, so um, I guess to uh, continue, um, let's talk a little bit about the um, live uh, music revenues versus recorded music revenues, um, which was something that you also did some research in your report. Um, can you give us a little bit more insight on um, what the historical uh, sort of um, uh, difference was between the live music revenues and recorded music revenues and how it's changing and what would be ideal for a market like Lithuania? Well, I think that it's hard to say what is ideal. Um, I can say that what we saw in the last decade was really not ideal before COVID. So before COVID, what I saw um, in this region is that live music was about 90% in Armenia, which was the worst, um, and only 10% royalties. In Lithuania and uh, the Central Eastern Europe, it was about 70-80% live, and almost no revenues, a little bit of revenues from royalties. Now, of course, this made the entire ecosystem absolutely irresilient for COVID. 
So something happens, bad weather comes, pandemic comes, you cannot open the venues, and all of a sudden everybody loses everything. So normally in the UK, it's a 50-50 share. And uh, before 2008, in the developed markets, actually the royalty part was bigger. Now, I think that the reason why I always talk about royalties is because I think that in this region, the lack of normal level royalties makes the system vulnerable. On the other hand, I also see that the live music is stronger and it can be a way, so, so, that, so if you can do a SWOT analysis, then the strengths is live music, so you should also build on that. Right. Um, and your weakness is royalties. And the threat is that, for example, live music cannot perform because of, you cannot heat the venues because the Russians stop supplying us with gas, which will be the same effect as COVID very soon. Right, so there's gonna be a huge cost increase in, for running live music. Um, and I guess what you're saying is we should not try and um, make sure that those revenues come from recording music into uh, come from live music into recorded music, but rather both sides of the business grows. Um, okay, are there any artists here in the audience? Any artists? Anyone? No artists. You're, okay, so uh, how much would you say of your revenues comes from live or from uh, recorded music? Thanks. So, hi everyone. Uh, basically, I come from two backgrounds. Uh, I'm the representative of Latga right now, and also I'm an artist and I'm an, I'm an author. So, uh, because my market uh, as an author and as an artist, my market is really, well, uh, niche, mm -hmm. I can say. It's like heavy rock music. So, our main income uh, as a band comes from live performances, of course. And from streaming, uh, streaming services, it's really, really little. So, yeah, but that's basically mm, the the whole problem is uh, that you cannot change the consumer habits. This is the main thing. Uh, of course, when we're talking about streaming platforms and royalties coming from streaming platforms, uh, now we are we can be talking about legislation. We can be talking about some imposing well uh, quotes, uh, market shares. But basically, it comes down, boils down to consumer habits. If, for example, I put on Spotify and I, well, make a playlist of uh, Lithuanian music, I mean only in Lithuanian, for example, uh, Lithuanian language, basically the algorithm will start suggesting me um, another Lithuanian artist, right? So basically, it comes down to what I listen to, what consumers listen. So I'm, I'm really, I'm wondering uh, how is it possible technically, to impose these implications on platforms. Uh, how can we do that? Because I, as a, uh, as a representative of Latga, as a collective management association representative, I cannot tell you uh, or anyone how can we impose this on users or on platforms themselves. So please, by all means. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Well, I think it's a super excellent question. and. Uh... The only thing I would argue with is that we cannot change what consumers do because consumers change their behavior in the last decade really, really a lot. And, and what we're trying to do in Slovakia is, is to increase the visibility of Slovak music, first of all, everywhere. So you have to be on radio so that actually somebody finds you and puts you on a playlist and all. That's, that's one thing. The second thing that you need to know is that these recommender systems will not recommend you to the right people if they don't have correct information. And unfortunately, what I see is that a lot of information, so they get metadata that is required to technically pay out the royalties, but they don't get the biographical information and the context from this region. So, you have to change what the algorithm is learning from. And eventually, I think that um, you can also make changes in the, in the legal system. So in the audiovisual industry, actually on French insistence, in the audiovisual directive, they just put a quota system on uh, streaming. And they told Netflix that if you don't meet the French quota, like the television on Netflix, then you're out of the country. And what happened? 
which I think is an incredible success. I live in the Netherlands. And Netflix put tens of billions of euros into European production. So actually, basically, the platform started to make sure that the correct local artists get a decent budget so they produce something that can actually be sold all over in Europe. So I think that I'm just giving three examples and it's more complex. It's, I know that it's a very complex problem that you're raising, but I think that you can tackle it little by little on many fronts and uh, I think that you can, you can get better quite soon a bit. A very interesting example, uh, the Netflix one. Um, do you have any insight whether that was actually made business sense for Netflix? Has it actually translated into more business success for them in terms of increased revenue or more viewers or something? How do the platforms view these changes? What's in their interest? Is it, is it actually paying off them to make these changes like the one that Netflix did that you just described? Well, I think uh, it's difficult to give a historical evidence because you have to see that Netflix's strategy was also very new and not always very ethical. So before this legislation, for example, anybody could set up a fake American address and subscribe to Netflix in the US. Now, the, the way these streaming services work in film is that they collect money from Lithuania and whatever they collect from Lithuania, they buy film licenses for this market. So if you have little Lithuanian revenue, then you have few films. In the US, you have a lot of revenue, so you have 10,000 films. So what happened basically is the whole world had fake US addresses, although Netflix collected this money from all over the world, it only bought the license of the film for the US. And then, of course, the film studio started to complain because it started to undermine the revenues from major markets. And that's also the point when the European Union started to intervene. So if you would just project Netflix's stellar growth, which was a kind of a pirate market, then compared to that, no. But I think that not only Netflix is, has a very solid revenue within Europe, but what happened is that there's a real competition in Europe. So an average Dutch household has two or three similar services because they just bought different content. So eventually I think that it's a successful policy and yes, I mean it also turned out that the European audiences actually want to see something else than US based productions. Right, uh, so I guess we always think about the digital world as some sort of a one thing but, but quite often is and in practice and legal terms is, is very segmented in a way. So would you say a similar thing can be applied in music as well and specifically in Lithuania? If so, what would your insights be? What should be done here? Well, I mean, of course, I cannot say that you can put into practice what the audiovisual sector did one by one. But here you really have to see what happened is that Netflix was forced into buying. It wanted to buy high quality. Um, I was brought up in Budapest, um, which is one of the biggest film hubs of Europe. Um, and they basically just put hundreds of millions of euros into Hungarian film production to make them able to produce something that is at the level of the expectations of an American viewership. So the same thing happened in Poland and Czechia because both these three countries have strong film industry backgrounds. The Polish actually more in film music. So Netflix started to make a lot of film music in Poland and a lot of um, production in Hungary and Czechia. So then you realize that those talented cinematographers or music um, sound engineers who were working for Peanuts and working on you know, uh, uh, the average production budget of a record in Central and Eastern Europe is somewhere between one and 3,000 euros. You cannot pay a crew of five people to do professional work. So what happened is that Netflix actually increased the budget of this production 10 or 20 fold. And it turned out, I mean, if you would, somebody would tell you that your band has a budget of 40,000 euros to record, 
then probably that would be something that you can put into the radio. So I think that we reach the point where there are so little revenues from the royalties that, well, the recording studios 20 years ago actually financed your recording. Now you do it from your savings, you pay your friends, and then they probably only just release it. So I think that basically you have to create a market and increase the revenues so that the production can be more valuable. Right, and still nobody listens because uh, only one third of music on Spotify actually has at least one play, right? Uh, so um, I guess um, there's there's also s similar, uh, I guess, music industry is, is often compared, especially the streaming one with Netflix, and we touched upon the subject. So what Netflix has started doing, they started producing their own content. Um, so with music services as well, do you see the same thing happening in the music industry where perhaps... Um, music services might might be signing artists or might be acquiring rights to some catalogs and potentially recommending that music over um, so, some else catalogs like the Lithuanian music artists or Lithuanian music catalogs, whatever we have here. So would you see the same thing happening at some point in the future in the music industry as well? Um, I think definitely yes. I can tell an anecdote which is both funny I think, and at the same time, shows that you really have to upgrade your skills to be prepared for this. So what happened, I think, two years ago, Spotify had a very long-term contract with the major um, labels, which happened to be their shareholders. And this agreement said that Spotify will never invest into content directly. So it's not going to compete with its shareholders and its major partners. However, now Spotify has more money than the entire music industry. So it brought in from Wall Street more than the entire revenue of, of their, its partners. And it tested the ground what would happen if this agreement would come to an end. So they started to actually produce music in Nigeria. The reason why they chose Nigeria because the contract said that they cannot compete with the labels, but none of the major labels had an office in Nigeria. So they right. said that we're not competing with you. You're not there. Well, all of a sudden, Nigeria became the headquarters of African music and everybody pop up shop. But the problem was, and here comes the dark algorithm theme that all of a sudden these never heard of Afrobeat ended up on every Spotify playlist and, every, right. and ended up on the top of the charts. So all of a sudden, Spotify actually made never heard of African artists the biggest stars. And then came the investigations in France, uh, the Centre National de la Musique and Deloitte made a very interesting forensic study trying to figure out, oh, but is the Spotify algorithm giving the same chance for its own music made in Nigeria as to us? And well, it is not. So I think that I don't know what will be outcome because maybe Spotify makes a deal with a few uh, publishers and, and labels or not. But eventually, I think that to play this right, you really have to have a good working knowledge of how these things work. And I think that's an educational purpose as well. So this question will come. So Netflix went to Hungary, Czechia, Warsaw, and the local players had to make good deals with them. And to make good deals with them, you actually have to know how these right. platforms operate. Makes sense. We still have time for a question, if there's any from the audience. If not, uh, there is a question. Oh, yes. Yay! Can we have the microphone there, please? There. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted kind of to clarify if, um, if I understood the whole idea of the listen local uh, thing. So, it, Am I right in thinking that you're suggesting that with the Slovak example, you are trying to make Slovaks listen to more Slovak music? And because the thing that I think we've noticed working with music and especially uh, yeah, with local, local artists, uh, I feel this is more of, of a feel than <laughs> any evidence-based thing, but... Um, so anytime you go and listen to a, a, an indie band that plays very, say, post-punk music that can sound exactly like anyone from London, and they are from Vilnius, so you play their music, 
it, you get uh, into that whole circle of Lithuanian artists and it, it never breaks out into the the whole you know genre maybe based area unless there was like support from the label or the 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 services etc and they were added to the playlist and broke through so um is that is that also an issue that the local uh, circle gets stuck in between itself well, it's it's very good that you ask this question i wish uh, the question came sooner because i would really like to talk about this a bit um, so let me just give you a few ideas what we try to do and I hope it will be clear enough. So first of all, we have um, a partner in the Netherlands who wants to build an app. An app that looks like Tinder, but it's matching people on a location basis with bands. Um, so if you get out of the train in Utrecht Central, it shows you music from Utrecht that you can swipe left or right, it puts it onto your Spotify playlist and also tells you if you can check out these bands live somewhere. Um, now, how you can do this actually? So what we're trying to do, this is just one idea, then somebody in Slovakia, they want to use a different app in schools to show children where music is coming from. So currently uh, the, the 1,000 most streamed songs on Spotify come from about 50 cities in the world, and none of them in Europe actually. So it's only US, Brazil, so Tokyo, I think that's all. Um, so an alternative way to discover music with games like, for this you need data. Um, so the way we're in, in uh, imagining Listen Local is that we're building fully open source, open databases of music, which are connecting to the collective management societies, the national library, Wikipedia, the services, and any app developer, and we give them usable and precise and up-to-date information every day. So for example, in Slovakia, we figured out what data is missing on Spotify about Slovak artists which is a very weird thing because that's what you as a distributor don't give to Spotify, but Spotify finds it through DBpedia, which is um, a semantic web application that connects, for example, Wikipedia and the Library of Congress and others to them. So if the Slovak artists are not described in these systems, then the Spotify algorithm just doesn't understand who they are. So what we're building is basically an open data application that can be used uh, for difficult, different applications that either help uh, venues to find local talent or do better playlisting by curators or develop games, use it in education. So what we're trying to do is a support system which will not directly solve these problems, but we will give guidance how to use this for your benefit. I really hope that I didn't make it more complicated than it is. Did I make any sense? Thank you. Great. So I guess as an ending note, is there any particular website or any particular place where you'd like to direct people that can read about a little bit more, maybe get in touch with you after the... So if they can receive or you can put somewhere the link to this presentation, all the green, uh, all the blue stuff are are live links in the presentation and it gives you the contacts to us and everything. So basically all the sure. examples you can read, so everything is there in links. Great. We'll make sure that's on What's Next Music Facebook Thank page you very and much. something that can be accessed. Great. Thanks very much, Daniel, for the great talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, and thank you everybody.